Wonderful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have brought us together after another week in which we have experienced your grace and your mercy, your provision, your preservation. We thank you that you are a great and a mighty God, and this week you have shown yourself to be sovereign on all that has come to pass, and, and, and you have uh, reached down to us in Jesus Christ, and as a kind and tender Heavenly Father, you have ministered to us your grace and your mercy. You have forgiven us for our sins every day in the Lord Jesus Christ. Every morning we have awoken with a willing heart, a heart that you have made willing, Father, because we know that left to ourselves, our hearts would not remain willing. You have made our hearts willing. You have generated within us a desire to, to know your word and to know people in order to be able to minister gospel grace into the lives of others. Well, Father, we thank you. We thank you for that. We thank you you've brought us to the end of this term and, and all that we've learnt this term from the scriptures about you and about people. And We ask that tonight as we consider the role of the Holy Spirit in counselling and the use of the scriptures in counselling, that you would give us that increasing reassurance and, and, and certainty that, that in Jesus Christ and in his word we can step into the lives of other people with confidence and certainty and assurance that rather than doing harm we will move people towards long-lasting life change in Jesus Christ. So we commit our evening to you, we commit our hearts to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. We listen to another counsellor. So we have, uh, with empathy, we have listened actively. And that has led to questions for clarification. That has led to questions of a heart nature, issues of the heart. And now we're ready to bring it down to long-lasting life change as we consider the gospel and the Bible and the Holy Spirit. Now, another way of looking at this is in these two levels here we establish relationship. We establish a relationship. In this level here we access hard issues. And in this level here we uh, bring it to um, the scriptures, to the Bible. Uh, we bring it to... Uh, Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Hebrews 4.12. And from there to the end of the chapter... Uh, we then come to the throne of grace to find help in time of need. So here we are using the scriptures to expose what's in the heart and then bringing that heart to the throne of grace for long-lasting life change. So we have listened in order to em empathize with the seeker. We have asked thoughtful questions in order to explore all that the seeker has said in order to gain further insight. That's the first two. But pastoral counselling is more than empathy, and pastoral counselling is more than insight. I should give you the lecture, shouldn't I? You're just looking at me blankly. That's not going to. That's going to get you through two hours looking at me blankly. Oops. I'll get one more. Yeah. What's that, Sue? What can't you read? All of it's pretty clear. What can't you read? Oh. <laughs> Questions of a heart, of a heart, oh, of a heart nature. Very good. So we have listened in order to empathise with the seeker. We have asked thoughtful questions in order to explore all the seeker has said in order to gain further insights. This takes us down to here. You see, so we have empathy and insight. Uh, or put that another way, in terms of Philippians 1, uh, 9 to 11, we have knowledge and depth of insight. Remember those verses? Knowledge and depth of insight. Empathy, 
hard issues. But counselling is more than empathy. Counselling is more than just sympathetic nodding while someone's talking. Counselling is more than insight. Counselling is more than just getting insights into what's going on in the heart. Our role is not ever over until together we have listened to another counsellor. It is the counsel of the Spirit of Christ that we must both seek. That's both helper and seeker, speaker and hearer. Both of us must seek the counsel of the Spirit of Christ. Only then is our task finished. Only then can we leave them with the peace of Christ, the truth of Christ, the conviction of Christ, the hope of Christ and the glory of Christ. Pastoral counselling must be Christ-centred. Well, those references at the top of the page, we'd just like to just look at those now and, um, and just look at them in a little more detail, beginning with John 14. John 14.25 All this I have spoken while still with you, but the counsel of the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. Now there, the promise of the Holy Spirit is um, couched in terms of one who will teach us all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. And notice that he's given the title of the counsellor. So, you put those two ideas together, and one who teaches us the things of Christ is one who brings counsel to bear. Counsel comes by way of Christ and his teaching and his word. When we are reminded of all that Christ has said and when we are taught all the things that pertain to Christ, we are being counseled by God's Holy Spirit. That is counsel. Verse 27. Along with that counsel comes peace. So it's a counseling of truth resulting in peace. When the heart is impacted by the truth of Christ, then the heart will know peace. And you see, it's not a peace that comes from the world. So we're not secular counsellors. We don't, through our counselling, seek to bring a peace to the helper that's based on secular ideas or understandings. It's not a peace that comes through finding hope in your own resources. It's not a peace that comes through finding hope in formulas or skills or steps. It's not a uh, a, a peace that comes through placing our hope in the strength of others to be there for us. It's a peace that comes when the words and the truth of Christ is pressed down into our hearts, pressed down into those dark and lonely places where we need the comfort and counsel of the Holy Spirit. That's counseling. That's counseling when the truths of Christ bring the peace of Christ and we know we've been counseled by the Spirit of Christ. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Why? Because I am going to give you a counsellor which will bring peace to your hearts by teaching you of Christ. Wow. Doesn't that encourage you to get into it? So there you are. You're sitting with uh, the seeker. There's the two of you and there's another counsellor in the room. This is the promise. He will send another counsellor. And so there in the room is the Holy Spirit and he's there to counsel both seeker and hearer. He's there to teach both seeker and hearer the things of Christ. He's there to teach both seeker and hearer, uh, bring peace to the heart of both seeker and hearer. He wants both seeker and hearer not to be troubled. You see, you could imagine the, the helper being troubled about, I wonder if I can help this person. I wonder if I can think of the right questions. I wonder if I could get it right as well as Peter Reynolds gets it right. 
if he gets it right at all. You see, that could be some of the things that your heart is troubled about as you think about doing this, this ministry in the lives of others. And, and, and you, you don't need to be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled and do not be afraid, dear Christian, because the counsellor is there to do that job. The Holy Spirit is there to do that job. You're simply an instrument in the Redeemer's hands. Well, the seeker, they're sitting there and their heart is troubled because they're wondering if you're going to be able to pull it off. They're wondering if you're going to be able to give them just what they need to deal with their circumstance and their situation. They're wondering if this process is going to work. They've agreed to these series of conversations, but they're very uncertain about the outcome. They're very uncertain about you. And, and, and where, where's their hope? Where's their certainty? Where's their peace going to come from? That Jesus Christ has promised to bring counsel and peace to their hearts as his word is applied to their situation. Chapter 15 of John, verse 26. John 15, 26. When the counsellor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you, so that you will not go astray. Now here's Jesus adding uh, some more insight into this ministry of the counsellor that he will send. This counsellor whom I will send you from the Father, so this, this Holy Spirit counsellor proceeds from both the Father and the Son. He comes, if you like, with the blessing of the Father and the Son. This is a Trinitarian presence in the counselling session. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is to the fore in the counselling ministry, but has been sent by the Father and the Son. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. It's like he comes with their blessing. He comes with their power. He comes with their active involvement in the process. So you have a Trinitarian help right there with you. This counsellor who comes from the Father, the Holy Spirit, is the Spirit of Truth. The Holy Spirit is referred to as the Holy Spirit. He's referred to as the Spirit of Christ different places, but here he's referred to as the Spirit of Truth. Again, you see that same idea we saw earlier, the counsel that he brings will be a counsel based of truth. It will be a truth telling, it will be truthful insights, it will be a truthful perspective. Through the Holy Spirit you'll gain a truthful understanding as to the seeker and the seeker's issues. It'll be a, uh, it'll be, uh, a, a pushing away of lies and false beliefs and untruths that have crowded in on the heart of the seeker and caused them to lose sight of the age to come that they're a part of. Remember that diagram? And they're all caught up in this present evil age. You see, and, and the word of truth will come, and the lies will be pushed back, the darkness will be pushed back, the false beliefs will be repented of, and the truth will come in, a truth that will set them free from whatever it is they came struggling with and bowed down with and burdened with. A truth that will set them free. Now, you see, you're not the source of that truth. That truth doesn't originate with you. You don't have to come up with that truth that will set them free. It's the Holy Spirit's job. The Spirit of truth will be there from the Father, from the Son. The Spirit of truth will testify about me, about Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So, you see, it, uh, speaking the truth will testify about Jesus, and so the seeker is hearing how this issue, the situation, the circumstance, this thorn bush situation in their hearts, how that can be applied to Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life, and now they're walking in a different way. They're walking in the way of truth. They're walking towards that fruitful tree. It will be a testi testifying about Christ so that as a result of this situation they find themselves in, they will become more like Christ, they will gain more of Christ, they will move in the direction of Christ, they'll be filled, filled with more of Christ, and, and they'll come back to their circumstance or their situation, which may not have changed, but they will be able to offer Christ in that situation in a way they haven't been able to before because their hearts have been so burdened and weighed down. Sixteen one. all this I have told you, so that you will not go astray. So as the helper, as the helper 
you will not go astray in your counseling and assistance to this person that's come for help. You will not go astray and you will not lead them astray. You will not you don't have to be afraid, you see, of going down blind alleys. You don't have to sit there wondering, I'm, uh, I wonder if I'm doing the right thing here. I wonder if we're going in the right direction here. See, if this is where you're headed, if this is where you're headed, the promise of the counsellor is that you will not go astray. The promise is for both the helper and for the seeker. The seeker will not go astray either as a result of your counselling. If this is where it ends up. See, if this is where it's headed. The Bible, the truth of Christ, applied to the situation. You will not go astray in your counselling. They will not go astray as a result of your counselling. Any time now, you can just punch the air and say, Wow! I can't wait to get into this ministry. Knowing that it's all of God and not of me. I'm simply an instrument in the Redeemer's hands. God is, here's another analogy, God is not my analogy, it's Paul Tripp's analogy. God is painting a picture of this person, the seeker's life. He's painting the picture of their life, past, present and future. And while the picture may look a bit dismal now, God in, this, in his painting of the picture intends it to be a, a dazzling and beautiful painting of their future. And as he paints this picture of the seeker's life, he's holding in his hand a brush by which he does the painting. And you, as helper, are the brush. You are the brush. He is using you as the brush to make the strokes, to fill in the gaps, to put in the colour, to make the outlines. That's what it means to be an instrument in the Redeemer's hands. You are the brush. He's holding the brush. <laughs> it's not the brush just whirling around on the canvas all by itself with no one holding on to it. You will not go astray. The brush master, the artist, is painting the strokes in accordance with what he wants. Uh, chapter 16, verse 7. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counsellor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment in regard to sin because men do not believe in me in regard to righteousness because I'm going to the Father where he can see me no longer and in regard to judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. Verse 7, but I tell you the truth that it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counsellor will not come to you, but if I go, I'll send him to you. Now, why is it good for us that Jesus is gone and the counsellor has come? Why is that good for us? And a lot of what we've been saying here, why is that good for us? Yes. See, imagine if Jesus was still walking around like he did in Palestine and there was no Holy Spirit. Someone had a problem, we'd have to send them to Jesus, wouldn't we? Well, you know that guy Jesus, he was here the other day. I think he's over in, um, I think he's over in Papatari today. Just buzz over there, you know, he'll be able to help you. <clears throat> you can imagine people following Jesus around for that very reason. But Jesus said, it's better for you because if I go... The Holy Spirit will come so you can do what I'm doing. That's why it's better for you. Because you can do what I'm doing. When he comes, he will convict the world 
of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment in regard to sin because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. In regard to judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So we've found so far that this counsellor when he comes, he'll come with the truth, he'll come with peace, he'll come with uh, um, the assurance that we won't go astray, and he'll also come with convicting power. He will convict of sin, he will convict of righteousness, he will convict of judgment. So that means you don't have to do any of those things as part of your counselling. You don't have to bring conviction of sin, you don't have to bring conviction of righteousness, you don't have to bring conviction of judgment into the counselling situation. All you have to do is bring the issues of the heart to the scriptures and the Holy Spirit will do that. That's his promise. Uh, how many times have you sought to bring your spouse to a point of conviction over sin? I guess it depends how long you've been married. The longer you've been married, then the more you've done it. <laughs> well, isn't it wonderful to know you don't have to do that? It's the Holy Spirit's job. What difference that would make to marriage relationship, any relationship? Same with children. <clears throat> it's not your job to convict them of sin. Well, you can't. So you can't change their hearts. Only Christ can do that. With children, it's our responsibility to lay before them the issues of their heart and lay before them the scriptures and pray that God will bring conviction and move their stony little hearts towards him. Uh, 12, verse 12. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. This is a, um, a promise given primarily to the disciples that they will be the organs of revelation and that the truth that they will be guided into will be a truth that they will write down and it will become gospels and epistles. But in a broader sense it also applies to us as we take up the scriptures that the apostles have written so that truth comes to us. And that truth comes to us is a truth that, that, uh, <clears throat> that we need to be hearing all the time a truth that needs to, we don't get it all in one big lump, we get it constantly. So as, as helpers, you see, we have to be constantly in the scriptures. And, and we have to bring the scriptures constantly into our counselling. <coughs> Verse 14, um, He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. Now that's why I've said there that um, our task is finished only when we leave them with the peace of Christ, the truth of Christ, the conviction of Christ, the hope of Christ and the glory of Christ. Pastoral counselling must be Christ-centred. If we don't leave them with Christ, we either leave them with ourselves as the counsellor, or we leave them with their own um, hope and their self-effort, and advice, and skills, and, uh, and, and formulas. If we don't leave them with Christ, there's no long-lasting life change. If we don't leave them with an understanding of how they can appropriate more of Christ through the gospel dynamics of faith and repentance, and bring more of Christ to the situation, then there's no long, lifelong and last change, uh, long, li long lasting life change, nor is there that fruitful tree that we saw last week blossoming in the midst of that situation and circumstance. <clears throat> okay. You don't have any comments to make about those scriptures that we've been looking at. So we have to be exposed to the, to the scriptures in order to gain that wisdom. And uh, we have to be exposed to people who need help in order to impart that wisdom. Yeah. 
almost like if we're not prepared to be in a situation to impart it, then we don't, therefore, we don't necessarily, um, we're not a channel, we don't actually necessarily get a drip feed, if you like, to us. Yes. So what that's really saying is it's like this. Um, if we if we think of this wisdom as a reservoir of knowledge that we have to get more of in order to pass on to others, yeah. that lines up with what you're saying. But if we think of this wisdom as something a little bit different from that, it's a wisdom that comes through living a gospel life. It's the wisdom that comes from us personally having the experience of recognizing our sin, repenting of our sin, seeking the forgiveness of others for our sin, experiencing the forgiveness of our sins, experiencing what it means to be reconciled and restored to others in spite of our sin. That's gospel wisdom. That's the wisdom which the Holy Spirit wants us to impart to others. You see, it's a, it's a wisdom which includes a conviction of sin, righteousness and judgment. In other words, it's a gospel wisdom. It's a wisdom that involves... Me living out of the gospel and experiencing the wisdom of gospel living so I can impart that to others. If we think of it as a reservoir of knowledge that I have to get access to, then it's a little bit like, um, like treating it like GTC, as there's a reservoir of knowledge here and I have to get access to some of it so I can pass it on. That's not biblical wisdom. Biblical wisdom is gospel wisdom. It comes through gospel living. That's why you had that self-counseling project. Uh, and the idea is that uh, as we have the experience of being counseled by Christ over our own sin, only then will we grow in wisdom and be able to counsel others. Uh, remember that um, self-counseling project, this is God counseling you, a personal ministry from his heart to yours. Um, We can't become a counsellor until we've first been a client. A self-counselling project, you become one of God's clients. And all of us are God's clients all the time. Uh, if, we're not a, if, we, if we lack self-awareness of our own sinfulness, then to that extent we're not coming to Christ for his counsel. Uh, Jesus Christ comes to us by his Spirit uh, through the gospel as the gospel message is applied to our life situation. To appropriate the power of the gospel for seeker's situation will mean fresh and perhaps first time application of faith and repentance by them as their hearts are laid bare before the word of Christ. This brings us back to this passage here. Uh, let's have a look at that again in Hebrews 4. Now, this passage is familiar to us, I'm sure. Uh, we've looked at it before in this course, and I'm sure you're aware of it in other contexts. But there's a definite progression here, uh, beginning with verse 12. It is talking about the, the, uh, the ministry of the Scriptures in our lives. And this ministry of the Scriptures is, a, is an alive ministry. It's an active ministry. If you like, it's a, uh, we talk about the Bible being a living word. It's, it's, a, it's an alive word because the Holy Spirit takes it and makes it an alive word. It's not our job to make it an alive word. And the Holy Spirit makes this word living and active. And in that living and active, it's described here as a double-edged sword, penetrating even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, judging the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now, in our, in our empathetic listening and in our questioning for clarification, and our questions of extension into hard issues. What we have done is we have begun, we have begun to uh, <clears throat> bring to the surface uh, the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I don't think we need to uh, make a distinction between soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Um, it's all referring to that inner part of us, that inner life, our heart, um, as it says at the end of verse 12. And and so 
you see, and it sees the end of verse 12, it judges the issues of the heart. So as these issues are surfaced by us in our counselling, we then expose those issues to the, to, the, to the scriptures here. And as those issues are exposed to the scriptures, so um, the Holy Spirit does his work of judging and of convicting and of encouraging and of blessing. In other words, counselling is not designed to bring them to a point of knowing more. Counselling is designed to bring them to a point of repenting more, where there's greater repentance rather than greater, greater knowledge. Otherwise, why would the thoughts and attitudes of the heart be exposed by the scriptures? Verse 13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now as those hard issues are laid bare, there in the counselling conversation, they're laid bare before the speaker, they're laid bare before the hearer. But remember, the Holy Spirit is there, the other counsellor is there. So they're laid bare before the other counsellor as well, the Holy Spirit. And as they're laid bare before him, they're laid bare before the one to whom we must give account. And that's where the conviction of judgment comes from. You see what happens here? It's the Holy Spirit through the scriptures that's moving them towards a point of repentance. If that diagram from last week, moving them down towards the, 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 the tree of the cross. Now when it gets to that point there in the, in the counselling, where the, the issues of the heart have been raised, and have been exposed to the scriptures, and there's um, uh, evident uh, conviction in the heart of the one that has come. Then you see verse 14 following becomes uh, the other half of the session, if you like. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Uh, I was talking to a couple some time ago and uh, uh, this man had um, uh, started a relationship with this young lady without divulging the fact that he was already married. And uh, they moved in together. Um, they're both Christians, presumably. They claimed to be at the time. They moved in together and she fell pregnant and then the wife turned up with the two children. When I, when I saw them, it was about 15 years on after that. They'd kind of struggled on. That they'd gone ahead and he'd divorced his wife, and they'd gone ahead and got married, and, and, and they'd struggled on for 15 years, as you can imagine. They would have struggled, given all that incredible uh, betrayal. And uh, so, you know, the, we were listening and gaining all this data, you see, about their relationship over a period of conversations. And then uh, we just asked a few more questions about um, extending the conversation. So do you mean to tell me that your marriage relationship began with secrets and lies and lust and adultery and fornication? Was that the beginning? Was that the foundation of your marriage? Uh, well, yes, yes. Based on what I've told you, yes. So my next question was, well, how do you feel about that? You see, that's exposure. That's everything laid bare before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. How do you feel about that? Well, both he and she were looking very uncomfortable at that point, very downcast, very disconcerted, very much aware that that their sin had contributed so significantly um, to their marriage difficulties. And at that point, I was able to say to them, I have good news. The blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient to cover your every sin. Now, see, they'd heard that message many times. They heard it afresh that time. And she looked at me and with a look of, of relief and wonderment, he looked at me with a look of total disbelief. How could it possibly be? 
there was uh, some years ago I was uh, counselling with a couple in there. I might have told you the story. If I have, just make an appropriate noise. I, uh, a couple who were in their um, in their uh, late forties, early fifties, and and they had um, got married when she was about twenty, and uh, right around the time they got married, they were both converted. So they got married as brand new Christians. And when she was 18, um, she had been raped and she had fell, fallen pregnant to the rapist and so she had had an abortion. A couple of years later, she was converted and married this guy and I was talking to them now in their early 40s. And uh, she, um, and part of the difficulty in the relationship was her anger towards him. He could never get anything right, no matter how hard he tried. She was just on him all the time. And, and there in the counselling session, you know, we saw her anger flare up a number of times against him. And uh, so, you know, we just patiently listen and, and ask questions for clarification. As you ask questions for clarification, you know, the whole story comes out. And the story came out about um, the abortion, you see. And he knew about that. Husband knew about that. And uh, uh, she said to me, um, oh, it's a sin that God could never forgive me for. And I said... Um, you know, good listening technique. Really? In other words, tell me more. She said, well, I murdered my baby. God can never forgive me for that. And um, so I just said to her, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. But she said, I murdered my baby. She's getting a bit louder now starting to get angry with me. I murdered my baby. God couldn't forgive me for that. So I said it again. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Now she was really mad with me. She sumped the table and she said, God could never forgive me. I murdered my baby. Like that. And her husband was, he, he, he was used to this kind of anger, you see. There was a pause. Then I said to her again, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And then she started to cry. And her husband started to cry. And as she cried, she started to sob. She just couldn't believe it. Well, you see, the heart issues are brought to Christ. And we're starting to press Christ down into an area of her heart where for all of her adult life she had believed was closed off to the gospel, closed off to the grace of God, closed off to the mercy of God. Well, as you can imagine, she, well, I suggested that she go home and put Romans 8, 1 up on the fridge. So that every morning when she goes to get the milk for cereal, for breakfast, she'd see it there and remind herself that today there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. So she went home and did that. The next time I saw her a week later, um, she was a lot happier. And as the time went by, she was less angry with her husband. It was really God she was mad with. And she's mad with herself. You see? Now, that's a God thing, isn't it? That's the Spirit of God at work. That's the Scriptures. That's living and active, dividing asunder. And, and, and you see, what we did was, we did that there in verse 7, 15. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet without sin. So Christ is able to sympathize. So he's able to empathize. Verse 16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Now, by sharing that verse with her, there was no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. That was an invitation for her to approach the throne of grace with everything exposed, everything out there. No more secrets. No more hiding, uh, holding on to a, a, a burden of guilt and shame that was crushing her and crushing her marriage. Approach the throne of grace with confidence that she might receive mercy and grace to help us in time of need. And the reason she was so angry with me is because I wasn't judging her like she felt she deserved. By offering her grace and mercy, I was disrupting, disrupting, all that she had believed to be true about herself and offering her something that she couldn't believe. To Christ, you see, bought his comfort, bought his truth, 
brought his peace to bear on her very tragic heart. So counselling is more than empathy, counselling is more than insight. Counselling is Christ. Uh, so what about with non-Christians? Is there anything you'd like to say or comment about anything thus far? Have you, have, situ have you had situations where you've talked to people and um, some uh, hidden things of the heart have kind of come out? And, and in the conversation you've kind of suddenly, both of you have suddenly become aware that here's, here's, a, here's a deep issue. See, I was talking to a lady once. All these stories are true, by the way. <laughs> I was talking to a lady once and she was telling me Again, if I've told the story, make an appropriate noise or gesture. Um, and she was telling me about uh, the way she'd really lost it. She was a Christian lady, really lost it with some non-Christian relatives. You know, they'd really, you know, <laughs> got her upset and she got mad at them and yelled at them. And, and she was saying to me, I feel so bad about that. Now, this wasn't counseling. This was a cup of tea, Sunday morning after church. Thing. And, and she said, I feel so bad about that. Now, in the course of the conversation, Hebrews 12, the Holy Spirit had laid bare for her and brought, judgment, brought conviction of sin and judgment, laid it bare, and, and now it was surfacing for her. She said, I just feel so bad about that. And I said to her, um, uh, your sin is a drop in the ocean of God's grace. And she was so mad with me. She just couldn't accept that. She just couldn't accept the comfort and the grace that comes with Christ. So we talked a bit more. And then towards the end of the conversation she said, is that really true? Isn't that a delightful question? You see, it was an, I was inviting her to come with her awareness of her sin, with her awareness of her guilt about her sin, I was inviting her to move towards the throne of grace, to receive grace and mercy in her time of need. You see, and she was resisting having to come because she didn't really believe there'd be enough grace there at the throne of grace to cover all her sin. Isn't that lovely? You see, people just need to be reminded in their moment of, in their moment of exposure and uncovering that the grace of God is sufficient to cover every sin. It sets them free. It sets her free to go back to her relatives and apologize. And in apologizing, she is demonstrating the power of the gospel to change a life. Let me just say a word about non-Christians. See, as we've been going down here, obviously we're, with this level here, we're talking about people who, whose hearts are activated by the gospel. What about with non-Christians. With seekers who come to you as unbelievers, that is, who see no necessity to be trusting Jesus Christ to cover their sins. Much ground can be covered as you listen with empathy and explore with sensitivity. This may be more than anyone has ever done with them, and the result may well be dramatic. It may soften their heart toward you and your message of testimony and hope. With their permission, you can then talk to them of Christ. That's down here. Pray with them and share insights from biblical passages, even as unbelievers. By seeking their permission, you are treating them with respect as you introduce them to a new way of living. So, you know, here you are at work and you're around the water cooler, you know, as you do, and, and uh, you wonder your non-Christian workmates are there. And you get talking and... Uh, you know, they talk about a problem or difficulty they're having, you see, and, and, you, and you talk about it in terms with empathy, you listen with empathy, 
You ask questions for clarification, and that's a brand new experience for them. No one has ever listened to them intently enough to ask questions for clarification. You mean you really want to know about all this stuff? Uh, well, yeah, sure. Why not? It's the boss's time. <laughs> Why not? So I've had to go back to my desk. So, you know, you ask questions for clarification, and then, and you know, and then you just kind of nudge the conversation a little bit, you know, around the edges, and and very sensitive to the Holy Spirit all the time. They may go with you if they, well, they don't go. If they don't go with you, you don't try to force it. But if they go with you, you see, pretty soon some things are going to be exposed. Pretty soon some things are going to be exposed, and. Um, you might say, well, look, uh, would it be okay with you if I, pr if I prayed for you for this, this week? And, uh, and uh, just see what God does. Mm -hmm. Okay, I suppose. They might say, no, I don't want you to do that. So, okay, you won't do it. They might say, well, okay, if you really want to. Or they might say, well, that's great. Thanks very much. And so next week or the week after, whenever find them around the water cooler again. You say, oh, how do things go with that situation? You see, and they've been thinking about what you said. They've been thinking about the fact you prayed for them. You see, and, and they might want to talk a bit more about that situation. Give you opportunity to say a little bit more. You see what you've done with the non-Christian. As you bring them down to here, you've probably done more for them than anyone else has ever done. And you may well have softened their heart to the point that they trust you enough to be able to listen to your counsel down here on an alternative way of living and relating in that situation they find themselves in. Any comments? Yeah. <coughs> I think that not repeating those times in that story you told about repeating to that lady and just leaving it at that and like that plus silence I guess um, yeah again it's you're not trying to fix her feelings and make her feel better because that's what people tend to do you don't want to upset people but you have to let people be upset for them to because being upset is what pain is what makes and when people, when so people tend to try and make people feel better because that's what we always do. Like. When people get upset, you're getting insight into what's below the below the waterline, below what's obvious. One of the most helpful things in marriage counselling is when the couple start arguing and fighting right there in front of you. <laughs> it's very, very helpful because you're seeing the way they are at home. They're not just putting on the act for you while they're, while they're with you. You're seeing them as they really are. So you, you don't stop it. You don't say, oh, look, we can't, have any, we can't have any conflict here. This is, you know, we're Christian counselors. We can't have this. You've got to stop that right now. <laughs> you see, this is gold. This is gold. Because, you see, as they're arguing with one another, look at everything you're seeing at the way they relate to one another. You're seeing what's important to each of them. See, they're not listening to each other in the argument but you're listening to each of them as they argue in front of you. Sometimes we encourage them to have a little fight right there. <laughs> and we see what's going on. What's wonderful for exposing hard issues, isn't it? So usually when we have a fight with our spouse, we don't realise that the, uh, the other counsellor is right there and his intention is to use the issues that are exposed in the conflict to move us towards Christ. In any conflict, intimacy is only sentence away. And you see, that's why conflict is so important in a marriage. Without conflict, there's no sanctification. People who avoid conflict in marriage never grow. Marriage is our last opportunity to grow up. You see? And, and we, we squander the opportunity without fighting because we don't fight productively. You see, when you, 
when you have a squabble with somebody, with a spouse, you are learning what's important to them. You are exposing what's important to you. Now, if either of you are sanctified enough that in the middle of the conflict you can stop and actually listen to what the other person is saying, you're going to learn some things about their heart which can only be seen and come out in a conflict situation. Conflict's not the problem. <laughs> Without conflict, there's no growth. It's what you do with the conflict. Does the conflict draw you together or does it force you apart? If you fight, you become enemies. If you withdraw, you become strangers. If you talk, you become friends. So conflict should lead to conversation. Oh, so that's what's important to you. Okay, I've been missing that all these years. Yes, you jolly well have been missing it. You see? And see, now you're, now you're talking in a way that's going to move you towards a growing understanding of each other's hearts. Okay, anything else? Confessions, testimonies? We can hear them all tonight. It's the final night of the term. You can give it to us all. We can handle it, can't we, guys? How have you got on uh, this term with putting into practice some of these things we've been talking about? Before we're done here tonight, we're going to have a role play, and I'll show you how I use the scriptures in a situation. We're going to go through the process in a minute. Uh, but just, um, how have you got on with, with all of this? Has it actually... Has it just has it been more than head knowledge? Has you actually worked it out in some of your relationships and 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 learned some things and found that God is in it? From my find with my family is that my kids go, oh, Dad's doing his counselling thing again. <laughs> <laughs> They're on to you, mate. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, so it's getting more authenticity. Uh, right. It's right. Yes, it's got to become a way of life yeah. rather than something that's. New. You don't go around on Sunday morning looking for people you can pounce on and ask uh, clarifying questions of. You see, it becomes a way of life. So, what what uh, what would you uh, what would you say to Alistair about it, about his children's reaction? They'll forget after a while. They'll forget. <laughs> I remember a woman said to Margaret once, a woman at church said, don't you counsel me. <laughs> okay, okay. And, and a year later, this woman was in counselor training to be a counsellor. You just, you just don't know really what God's at. You maintain a non-anxious presence and continue to offer them Christ. I think um, in, in answer to is, is the question about what you say to Alistair, I think... Um, as, as you incorporate that kind of talk into your personality and it becomes you, I think they'll take it for a fact that it's genuine rather than you just practicing your counselling technique. Very good. And as they Very good. you really do care yes. and you really are empathising, then yes. it'll be more effective. That you're not just practicing empathy, you really are an empathetic person. Yeah. <laughs> It occurred to me though when I was uh, with the kids, you know, because at times you just get so irritated with your kids and you just want to give them a good spray and make <laughs> you feel better. But you realize, uh, one of the things I've realized when I've tried to do this is that, is that you actually don't, they don't actually get an awful lot out of it because all they do is pick up that you're irritated and they obviously did something wrong, but they definitely don't self evaluate. You know, they don't. All they do is, you know, I'm getting punished now. I'm sort of, uh, you know, Dad's losing the plot with me here on this one. But they're not self-evaluating. They're not, they're not getting their hard attitude. They're not being, you know, no lights being shed on it. There's nothing happening in that. And once it's all over, they just sort of think, oh, well, I took my spray and I'll, I'll move on, sort of thing. But nothing's happened inside. So, what would you like to say to Alistair about that? I don't know what kind of spray he uses. <laughs> no. Well, one, 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 uh, one approach there is to realise that uh, the children have to have that role, role modelled to know what that looks like. What does it look like to be self-aware, to evaluate, to uh, be aware of own heart issues? And uh, so to role model that before them, before the family. 
as they see you examining your own heart issues and, and uh, um, inviting them to talk to you about your heart issues in order for you to be brought to a place of repentance and confession, you see. And then, and then uh, that becomes a way of life for you and a way of life for the family dynamic. Then it's not something which is going to be uh, strange and awkward for them, necessarily. I find that, um, that when I try to um, get my children to see the hard attitude, um, quite often they will see it, but uh, when I try to get them to admit it, to confess it, they, they say, I don't want to, I don't want to say that. <laughs> so they, they say, I know, but I don't want to say it. They'll actually say that. You've got some client resistance there, have you? Yeah. <laughs> Well, what you've done is probably a wonderful, wonderful, uh, to get to that point is, is, is very good, to where, you know, they've acknowledged that there's hard issues. Um, you see, to go, to go right through to the gospel, to confession and repentance, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we can't force people there. It's the Holy Spirit's job to bring them to that point. So I would say just relax and continue to pray for them, continue to uh, present to them, the authentic um, uh, Christ-centered life, your own life of, of, of uh, gospel repentance, and um, pray that the Holy Spirit will bring them to that point of being willing to confess and repent. What if some people will resist because that's kind of like, if they get to that point, it's like, you won. I lost, you won. You know, people don't like any kind of Push it all, having to feel like they have to admit something. You've got to be led by the Spirit. That uh, Shepherd in a Child's Heart by um, Ted Tripp, that might help you. There's a teenager version for that too. Um, that has some wonderful insights on how to shepherd a child's heart, a teenager's heart. Okay, well, let's take a break for 10 minutes, and then we'll come back and uh, look at the process, and then uh, we'll talk about the exam. So you can either use your Bible, or if um, they bought a Bible with them and happen to have one, use theirs. Then lead them through the passage, asking them questions, exploring their answer, and adding your own insights. Thus it becomes an interactive dialogue. You have a conversation together about the text. The Holy Spirit will bring his own comfort and conviction. He brings us both, his comfort and conviction. He, he exposes the attitudes of the heart and he draws them to the throne of grace. See, both conviction and comfort, the actions of the Holy Spirit. So what I'm saying here is you don't take it as an opportunity to preach a sermon to them, a mini-sermon or otherwise. It's not a monologue. It's not you teaching them from the text the truth that they should understand and apply. You have an interactive conversation about the text. You ask them questions about their understanding, and you go backwards and forwards. And so the, the, the reason for that is so that, that they come to their own conviction about how the text applies to, that, to their situation that you've been discussing together. Now, you may well have, way up here somewhere in this process, you may well have come to some uh, insights and understandings about where they're at in their heart and what scriptures they need and where they need to go well in their life. And she was looking at it, and she was really having trouble connecting with what the passage was saying. And so we um, suggested that she look at it over the week, during the week, and then come back next week. When she came back next week, she was so excited. She couldn't believe that that Bible passage understood so accurately her situation and all that she was feeling about her husband and about their marriage. And everything that she thought about him was all there in the passage. You know, she was ready to say, you're this and you're this and you're this. But it was all, it was all said for her. In other words, God understood her situation and, and God uh, had already spoken about her situation, had already interpreted her situation for her and, and it was a great comfort to know that she wasn't alone. Well, uh, they both started going to church after that as a couple and, and we kind of lost contact with them. But it was just, it was a very powerful example of how the scriptures, even for an unbeliever could uh, bring such comfort and draw them closer to uh, 
the truth. So uh, they need to make it their own. So <clears throat> interact with them, have a conversation together about the text. Often a passage of scripture can be assigned as a take-home task to read and or journal over. Now here's my suggestion for you in this, in order for you to gain confidence in using the Bible in these situations. Have, one or, have two or three passages of scripture you become very familiar with. Research commentary, seek insights from others, rework and apply the truths to your own heart and relationships. Make them your own, become comfortable and familiar with them to where you can confidently spend time with the passage, drawing out its meanings in your conversation with the seeker as you invite them, as you invite from them a heart response. A passage that you that has had a meaningful impact on your life, that you've researched well, you understand well, you know it well. And uh, it kind of, it's like, a, it's like a slipper. It just kind of fits on and just feels very comfortable for you. And you have a sense of ownership about that passage. And so when you come to use that passage, and you can talk to them about that passage, you have some measure of confidence about where you're going, some confidence about using it, about bringing it out and putting it before them. So uh, um, And so just, you know, have... Um, have two or three passages like that. Now, you may, you may use the same passage over and over with different seekers, but the seeker doesn't know that. The seeker doesn't know you're using, this is a passage you use with other people. Um, so what you're communicating to the seeker is an, an absolute confidence in the scriptures, an absolute fam familiarity with the scripture, and so they can have confidence in the scripture you're sharing because of the confidence that you have. If you don't know the, the scripture very well, if you're hesitant about the use of it, they're going to pick that up and, and uh, be less confident, less sure about taking it on board. Uh, for instance, with uh, couple counselling, one passage I use a lot is um, uh, Ephesians 4.25, uh, Therefore put away falsehood and speak truthfully one to another, for we are members of the same body. Uh, to get couples speaking the truth to one another is a huge breakthrough. Um, and so what you do, and, you, and so you've, um, uh, as you're questioning with them and hard issues and things surface and it's obvious that, you know, things have been kept and things haven't been explored, things haven't been honestly explained and someone might, uh, you know, when, when you get the silent treatment, your spouse won't talk to you. They've been, they've been, it's, it's falsehood. They're refusing to speak the truth about how they feel. They're backing away from speaking the truth. Being silent is their way of avoiding having to speak the truth. Why don't they speak the truth? Because they think the truth's going to destroy them, or the relationship, or make things worse. If I say what I'm really feeling, he, she will just go bananas. Okay, well, let the chips fall where they may. Speak the truth. Put away falsehood. We are members of the same body. Okay? Uh, and then after you've done that, pray for them and invite them to pray. Now, I've included some of my favorite passages from the epistles. Um, of course, you don't have to... Uh, you don't have to... Uh, confine yourself to the epistles. Those are the, some of the ones that um, uh, I use quite regularly. Um, as you go through your GTC courses and in your private devotions and your sermon listening, be looking out for passages of scripture that impact your own heart that you can then in turn use in your pastoral counselling. Okay, anyone got any... Uh, well, maybe we'll do the role play first, eh? then you can have some questions. Before we do that, I want to um, pass out this the pastoral counselling matrix. Uh, this diagram is designed to summarise everything we've done this term. <laughs> you pass that over to that young man down there. Pastoral Counseling Matrix shows a summary of the aspects of pastoral counseling we've covered this term. These aspects 
have been placed on a matrix to show that they can occur without a fixed pattern or order. So rather than seeing them like this, like this, one, two, three, four, I put them on a matrix to show that uh, uh, <coughs> they can occur without a fixed pattern or order and often do. Uh, however, all these aspects must be part of the process, process if it's to be uh, prove effective and life changing. So, uh, if you're talking to someone about something, your children or your spouse, maybe it's an ongoing conversation, somebody at church, uh, the matrix is quite a good way of asking yourself uh, what aspects of the matrix are lacking in our conversations, in my conversation with that person. Maybe I'm doing lots of listening, but I'm not doing too much of acknowledging or summarising. Or maybe I'm asking lots of questions and inviting ongoing conversation, but I'm not making much use of the Bible. Or maybe I'm making lots of use of the Bible and not doing too much listening or attending. So it's just a reminder to ensure that uh, you're hitting the key issues there. So attending, we haven't done a lot with stance, posture, eye contact, attitude, relax. Uh, this is part of uh, active listening, right at the beginning, where you're involved and connected with the person and the way you sit and don't fold your ha don't fold your arms and lean back, but kind of lean forward and you know be attentive that kind of thing. Remember talking about that? Active listening, acknowledge by reflecting, clarifying and paraphrasing, summarise to ensure a shared understanding, ask open-ended questions to explore and extend the conversation, invite ongoing conversation, uh, questions that invite ongoing. So what did you mean by that? Uh, um, what else did you feel? You see, it invites ongoing conversation. Use the Bible for heart and life change. Um, <clears throat> one way of thinking about these aspects of pastoral counselling is to see them as different ways of showing love to a troubled seeker, love that proactively invites them to move uh, towards Holy Spirit-initiated change. These are all the different ways that you can love somebody. These are all the different ways you can love your spouse, love your children. Love the people at church. Here's a conclusion. If you have the opportunity to speak to a troubled person, invite them into a series of four or six one-hour conversations to work through the process, enable to work through the process with them that we've discussed this term, this process here. So say you get talking to someone at church after for a cup of tea or someone at work, non-Christian, around the water cooler, whatever, and uh, you have a relationship with them, and uh, an issue has come up, a significant issue, an issue that's important to them. And so you have a, um, you have a conversation with them there, say it's at church for 10 minutes or a quarter of an hour, and then they have to go. Before they go, you might say to them, uh, look, could we, um, could we have coffee this week and, and so we can carry on with this conversation where we left off? Uh, and they say, sure. So you have a coffee with them. And... Uh, and you go back to the conversation where you left off at church. And then before you finish with the coffee appointment, you invite them to uh, a series of four conversations or six conversations, however you're feeling confident. You might say to them, well, look, what, what say we, we do this every week for the next four weeks, just meet for coffee and just spend an hour talking about this issue and uh, see if uh, we can't get some wisdom and insight from the Lord as to what's going on here and and what you can do about this. Would that be something that would be helpful for you to do that? And uh, if they say yes, then you have an opportunity to begin to work through this process with them. So you'll, uh, uh, if, that, if that coffee counts as one, then there's three more if there's four. Or there might be five more if you agree to six, or if you agree to five, you see, whatever you agree to. And they may say, oh, it won't take that long. And you say, well, that's fine. Just, you know, just whatever will work for you. Um, and, and so you might spend, the, you know, the next, uh, the next session listening to them empathetically and then the next time you just begin asking some questions and, and, and you're very much led by the Spirit in all of this. You know, we listen to another counsellor. We're very sensitive to what the Holy Spirit seems to be leading and guiding in the conversation and, 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 and uh, be asking the, the Lord to give you some scriptures you can share with them at an appropriate time. Now, even though you've got the matrix there, you can appreciate that if you start doing this up here, 
You see, you may lose them, may lose the relationship. You see how this is essential to establish the relationship? This is essential to expose heart issues and the Hebrews 4 process, and then you bring them to the throne of grace. That's the fruit of the Spirit, actually, in your own life. The fruit of patience is that you're actually willing to... Wait. Yes. Yeah, Not hurry the Spirit. Mm. Not hurry the process. Often with people will say, well, look, you know, we'd like to uh, sign up for, um, you know, commit to six sessions. Oh, it won't take that long. It won't take that long. You know, and... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that situation of this couple came in the first session, right? And then during the week she calls up and said, well, um, we didn't achieve much in the first session. I expect that we get a lot further than that. This is a bit of a waste of time. <laughs> oh, dear. And, and we said, well, um, let's shoot for the six and see what happens. And by session five, we started to make some progress. <laughs> see, towards down here. And she said at the end of session five, wow, it really did take five sessions, didn't it? What she meant was to get my stubborn-hearted husband looking at the scriptures. But see, that's, she expected it to happen in first session. She was so keen for him to change. Well, God bless her. You know, why wouldn't she be? But see, it just, you can't hurry the spirit. So don't be, don't be embarrassed about, don't be shy about asking for a, a four or six series of conversations. Formally, do you do people come to you knowing that your framework is the Bible and Christianity? Like, do most people, if they're non Christians, know that already? It's there on our brochure and in our advertising, but we, we uh, in the very first session, regardless of whether that, where they are with the Lord, we always tell them that where we're coming from. This is we counsel within a biblical framework. With your permission, we may use the scriptures and we may pray with you but only if you're comfortable with that. Uh, are you okay if we proceed on this basis? And um, I don't think I've had a no yet. There's a, there's a big danger, isn't there, in <coughs> not taking the time and ending up with superficial changes that yeah. in the short term seem to have worked, mm. but you might never know what goes, you know, how long they last or what goes on mm. later if it's too forced or too quick. Yes, don't be in a hurry. Don't be in a hurry to get down here. <laughs> this is the Holy Spirit work. And if you start giving advice up here, you really will terminate things very quickly. We potentially might not see them again. Is it any point having a conversation with her at all? Sorry, say that again? It, it, if it may just be a one-off, or may not, may, not, may not see this person again, and is there any point in, in saying anything? Is there any point in kind of, there's a kind of impromptu conversation right. to start along this track if you know you might never see them again? Right. Because almost you inevitably not get to a point. I mean, it will be quite easy for, uh, for it to happen that you you can just do the first one and start to, to have empathy and, and not even get to the heart issue. Well, that's the approach I take. If I'm talking to someone and I know, you know, like they're just flown in from Timbuktu and tomorrow they're going to fly out to, you know, who, what's it, where. You see, I just listen to them empathetically. That's all I do. I don't try to squeeze the whole process into one session. If they want to talk, I'm happy to listen and be empathetic and um, uh, ask a few clarifying questions. I guess I had um, one opportunity to do something like that and I was frustrated at the end because I could sense there were some big issues there but this person wouldn't share them with me and she was instead, she was really upset and she was uh, very emotional and she was trying to fix all the people in her life but I can see there's some there really some big issues in her life and yet I just felt I didn't really do much good listening to her because 
I, I listened to her and then we prayed together. And yeah, at the end of it, she's like, okay, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and this. And I'm like, oh, she's missed the whole point. Is this someone that you will be seeing again? You have an ongoing yeah, relationship with? Probably not. It's sort of a friend of a friend, and she's now not based in, in New Zealand. Oh, right. And it's probably right. because of some of the issues that she's got. Yes. Well, I think you did the right thing. All you can do is this. If you just have the one opportunity, you just do this and pray with them. It's all that God has given you opportunity to do. And it may, it may be that wherever, that wherever she ends up going, she'll remember that encounter with you and she'll look for someone else you can perhaps help her. So you wouldn't suggest to them the same thing, like myself, maybe there are some issues here, I encourage you when, wherever you go, and you might want to consider seeking some help. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're obviously yeah, I do that. that it might happen. I'm saying I don't think there's got to be anything wrong with suggesting that they yeah. look out for someone, you know. No, very good. If they're... Yeah, if they're open for that. It doesn't sound like this person is particularly open. Um, Some people take 20 years. Like in 20 years' time, you could bump into her somewhere else, who knows where, and she's tried her way for 20 years and find at the point where she's had enough and would listen. So it's not wasted. No, so don't, don't feel the pressure, you know, to get through all this with any one person. Just start out here and see what God does with it. So I think that's the thing is that when you take the understanding that it's God, not us, who actually does the work, then we don't have to look at a one-off encounter as a waste because we know who knows where God's going to take that one encounter. And it's like I guess when you share with a non-Christian, you know what happens to them, that you trust God's going to keep working. And exactly right. And if somebody else happens to be the person who gets down to the end and really is able to at that final stage, well, you know, praise God, I guess you've been there part of the, the journey. That's right. Very good. Yes. Remember John the Baptist? I am not the Christ. Yes, the Holy Spirit is here. So, um, yeah, just as you think about <coughs> what to do with all of this and your relationships with people, uh, think about the process, think about the opportunity, think about inviting people into a series of conversations. Uh, in the... Um, I think with a in, in a in a pastoral situation, most pastors have a have a uh, in their mind a, a framework of six conversations. In their pastoral counselling, they'll uh, ask people to come and see them over six periods of conversation, six weeks or whatever, and and, and they'll work through that process. At the end of the six weeks, they'll evaluate and decide where to go from there. And so m most pastors will do that in quite a formal way, quite a self-conscious way. Well, um, I'm, what I'm encouraging you to do is to do the same thing, but in a, in a less upfront and formal way. You just invite them to a series of conversations over coffee or whatever, at a place of their choosing. It might be in their home, it might be in your home, where, they're with, where they feel comfortable, where they feel safe, where you're not going to be interrupted. Uh, don't be tempted to go beyond the hour to two hours or two and a half hours. Um, and, and try to keep it a weekly sequence so you get a process going. So there's a time for reflection, then you're coming back to it. You keep the momentum going. So just have fun with it. Just play around with it. See what God does with it. Just launch out. <laughs> oh, so you've been talking to uh, Sue McClure. Oh, wow. Oh, oh. <laughs> I've got to pick up all these pieces. <laughs> so if they're seeing you, they won't need to see me. Very good. Well, who would like to um, be part of a role play tonight to bring an issue to the role play and um, for me to have to come up with an appropriate passage of scripture not knowing what you're going to talk to me about? be anything at all, Michael. Whatever is on your heart or not on your heart. It's up to you, really. He jumped in quick, didn't he? Good day, Michael. Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you, old chap. It's been a while. What's been going on with you? 
Um, every, every now and then I, um, I have trouble sleeping. Um, just go to bed and close my eyes and things just start racing around in my head and, and um, sleep just doesn't come. Is this on Thursday nights? Um, <laughs> no particular night. Um, just, it just depends, I guess, on things that are in my mind. Okay. And, um, and I just, I just, they just go round and round in my head, and no matter how much I try and put them out of my head and put them to rest, they just keep bugging me, and, and um, they don't go away. So, is this every night of the week, or how many nights a week would this no, be? No, um, it would just—it would usually just be one night, occasionally. And um, but what it what it does—it's it usually happens when I'm tired anyway. And um, and I just think of all these things that I've got to do, and this will happen. And, oh right. And the. Um, the outcome will reflect on me, I guess, as a, as a person. Oh, okay, okay. And um, and so I just, I, I try to think through in my mind how I'm going to achieve all these things, but, right. but I don't seem okay. to have any peace that I'll be able to. So it sounds like what you're saying is that when you have a whole lot of things that you have to do, you worry about the consequences of not getting them all done. That's right, yeah. And what would be some of those consequences that you would fear might happen? Um, I guess I, I feel like I've failed in that particular, on that particular thing. If it's, a, if it's something to do with work, okay. you know, I feel like I've, I've failed in that. I guess it causes a lot of anxiety. Hmm. You know, <sighs> Mm. Um, am I going to um, encourage my kids in the right way? Am I spending enough time with them? Um, um, mm. Yeah. Sounds like a lot of pressure. What pressure to get it right? Pressure to pull it off? Yeah. So. yeah. And if you, if if in the work situation you you failed, to use your word, you failed. What would be the consequences of that? Sometimes I can't really pinpoint what it is that's that's really bugging me. It's just all these things just okay. Just um, cause anxiety. Okay. Well, I, between being a a provider for the family as well as a spiritual leader for the family. That's right. Yeah. And sometimes that keeps you awake at night worrying about that. It does. Yes. Yeah, okay. And if if you. <coughs> If it turned out that you weren't the spiritual leader that you wanted to be or ought to be, what might wow. be the consequences of that? Well, that's a big responsibility. That's a big responsibility. Mm. I can understand why that would keep you awake at night. It'd be a big responsibility. Mm. Yeah. And, and just um, wanting to make sure that I, you know, as they grow, that I. Um, can I share a verse of scripture with you? Please do. Okay. This is in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11. You could read that out for me please. And verse 11 down the bottom there. In him we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. And sorry, in the next verse. In order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. So in verse 11 there, when it says everything, uh, is there anything you think is excluded from that everything reference? So it's, it's everything. Everything. 
everything. Okay. So what would happen if you substituted everything for um, your personal failure? So could you read the verse again and this time instead of the word everything, could you put in there my personal failure? And him we are also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out your personal failure. Who works out my personal failure in conformity with the purpose of his will. And the next verse? In order that we who are first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. What do you think about that? That's pretty encouraging. <laughs> How do you think your personal failure could be to the praise of God's glory? another way is that in the midst of personal failure people see you trusting God in terms of verse 11 and that causes them to glorify God as they see how strong your faith is even in the midst of personal failure Well, you've, um, you've, you've, that's, that's a big burden. That's a big burden you're carrying. And, and um, yeah, it is encouraging that whatever happens, he will work it out for his glory. Yes, it is. I guess it's um, something to understand, understand that. But it's, it's not something you can just automatically <laughs> tell your heart to accept and, and believe <laughs> I think it, it takes time for it to sink in yes that's exactly right it takes time if you've been if you've been uh, struggling with this burden and sense of responsibility for a long time then uh, it's going to take a while for a truth like that to sink in and begin to counter that belief that says I'm ultimately responsible for how my kids turn out. For that to turn around and say, well, I'm just, a, I'm just an instrument in the Redeemer's hands with my children. God alone is responsible. He alone determines. And whatever happens with my kids, it'll be to the praise of his glory. And he won't hold you responsible. Very good, sir. Well, look, thank you. And we must talk again about these matters. Would you be okay with that if we were to talk again about them? Sure. Okay. Maybe five or six conversations. <laughs> right, then I would, I would pray with Michael and send him on his way rejoicing. Okay? Now, oh, yes, sorry, thank you. Yes, lovely to see you. Okay, comments? Comments about uh, use of Bible and counselling. There's many scriptures we could have used. How do you think about the way I did that? You okay with the way I did that? 
Yeah, I certainly thought it was helpful the way that you helped him to personalise the the um, that that text to himself, and, and um, you know he, he avoided it. it, it I mean, you know, you sit there and I, you know, I was thinking you feel like the point that you made, you actually probably, by doing what you did, you, you probably got him to see for himself what you could have told him, but then he probably wouldn't have got himself, well, he wouldn't have necessarily taken on board. So I thought it was quite good the way he did it. And I think the, um, you know, the way you just helped him to personalise it was good because sometimes, because as Michael alluded to, most of our problems are, are, are never an issue of knowledge they're an issue of belief and yeah. and That's you recognize that from doing it and and you were you were good with that you know you, you, you know and probably you know as you said you, you know you'll need time for the holy spirit to convince you of this truth and there's no pressure to sort of you know what's wrong with your brother believe it believe the blinking scriptures in black and white you know <laughs> it was, so that was good yeah see i know he believes them Yes, you, that's very good. It's not a matter of knowledge; it's a matter of the heart. Mm -hmm. And I trust the Holy Spirit. I trust the Bible to do its work mm. in my brother's life because I know his heart is open. Okay. Any other comments? Hard to see how how that would have needed five one-hour sessions to get to the points you got to in ten minutes. Yes. Now, see, that's a good question. That, with the role play, you see, I asked one clarifying question immediately followed by an extending question. Did you notice that? They were moving pretty rapidly through here, weren't we? But, you know, he's, he's been in the class all term. I know him well. He's a, he's a brother with a wonderful open heart to Christ. And so I was pretty confident about where we were going. But it is a role play. It's not how it happens in real life. What are some other scriptures that we could have used in that situation? Did you think of any? Uh, my, my grace is perfect for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. That would have been a good, that would have been a very good one. Yes. Okay. Okay. Just the one being just for nothing, but in everything with parents' petitions. But your request for me and God and the peace of God surpasses all understanding, guard, hearts, and mind. I like that one a lot because I'm going to stay with the same thing. <laughs> Anxiety, whatever. Okay. Guarded by peace. Now, see, Ian, you know, um, with an issue like that, it would take, it would take a whole series of conversations, really, to explore the ramifications of that. Um, see, when a man is burdened, when a man accepts the responsibility for his children's walk with God, we know that will eventually crush him and destroy him, because that's not a responsibility that God has given him to carry. God alone determines what what happens in terms of our relationship with Him. He alone determines. As parents, we don't determine. As parents, we have a significant impact on our children's Christian experience, but we don't determine whether they walk with God or not. Only He does that. He is sovereign in salvation. So when we have a significant impact. So if our impact has been negative, we can confess that to our children and, and, and gain their forgiveness and be released from that less than perfect impact. But in terms of responsibility for whether they walk with God, He never makes us responsible for that. I think that too, the reason that you know, said about how quick that was is that you know, I, I could imagine that you could speak to somebody and you might spend an hour with them and they wouldn't give you or have self-evaluated like my father. That's mean, right. Michael pretty much knew in his own heart That's what, right. what his struggles were. But a lot of people might sort of either resist or never having really thought too hard or tried to self-evaluate, whereas Michael obviously had. And right. It, it sort of, he didn't have... He, he, he made just, it very easy for me. He did. He, he, he did. He just... It came out where somebody might be struggling to understand why they were, what was going on below the waterline. Really. Yes, Michael obviously found a bit of that. So within the first couple of minutes, Michael had taken it right down here to heart issues, hadn't he? Mm. He put his heart issue right out there. 
is, is, is fear of failure and the, the weight of the responsibility. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yes. Indeed. It's interesting just with the, the cycle of health, because you're actually almost turn it into a formula and think, oh, there's, there's four things, we've got to the end, we've heard about that thing, therefore, it must be the end of the housing relationship. But it's, it's sort of seen beyond the formula and seen how God does convert and help and encourage through His Holy Spirit and through His Word. It's not like it's not a seven-step, four-step, or any step. I mean, no. God's continuing working in yes. life. It's not a 12-step recovery. <laughs> and, and remember, see, you're doing this in the context of the local church. So you're going to have an ongoing relationship with these people for many years. So if you only get one hour with them, one session, one, you know, you've talked to them after church and they don't want to talk to you anymore, that's fine, don't take it personally, knowing you're going to be in a relationship with these people for a long time to come, if you've got a if you're in a church with a stable congregation. And it's often it's a matter of timing. Um, it's, it's amazing the number of times people after a period of time have come back and they're ready to talk. So just maintain a non-anxious presence in your relationship with them and wait on the Lord's timing. Let me say some things about the exam for all those of you fortunate enough to be sitting the exam. Uh, central part of the learning process. Uh, it's a one hour exam. Uh, now all these instructions will be exam paper but I'll provide the, or the college will provide the line paper for you. You don't need to bring paper, just bring a pen. And Bible is allowed to be used. It's, um, uh, it's one hour and there's four questions. And each question has the number of marks indicated. And your answering time is one minute per mark. So if it's a 10 mark question, you spend 10 minutes answering it. If it's a 25 mark question, you spend 25 minutes answering it. And when the 10 minutes is up, you stop and move to the next one. Because by the time you get to minute 9 and minute 10, nothing you're going to say is going to make a difference to your grade for that question. By then it's all packing. All the good oil has been said in the first few minutes. So stop and move to the next question, even though you've got other things you think might be relevant. Um, so here are, the, here are the questions. I'll give you the four questions. The first question is to do with uh, uh, the secular theories of counselling and uh, how we should relate to the secular theories using scripture to support our answer. Uh, ten minutes, ten marks for that one. Um, Uh, the second question concerns the uh, the downward spiral of James 4, 1 to 12. Remember the downward spiral? <laughs> we did the downward spiral, didn't we? Yes, yeah. we did. Okay. So there'll be 10 marks on that. Um, here's the big one, 25 minute one, number three. Uh, uh, we had four lectures on counselling, so I'm asking you for 25 minutes to write what you've learnt about listening. The four lectures on listening, write what you've learnt about listening in the counselling relationship. Uh, we had... Um, here they are here. One, two, three, four. So I'm basically asking you to uh, explain that process. And the fifth one is a question about the, uh, the counselling matrix. Okay, it's just a one hour exam. So if you come at seven, we'll be done by eight. Get to go home early. And you essentially told us we just have to cover everything, study everything we've covered. <laughs> <laughs> it all comes out of the lectures, nothing from the readings. And if you want to have a go at the exam, That'd be fine. You probably know this stuff as well as he does. Can stop grazing? 
<laughs> yeah, right, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Just pick whatever grade's the highest and make it Andrews. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Okay. Well, look, thanks, guys. It's been a wonderful term, and you've been a wonderful class. And uh, we'll see you back on April the 26th for term two. Um, I'll just pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for those wonderful truths we've seen tonight about the Holy Spirit and his comfort and his counsel to all of us in time of need. And we ask, Father, that the, uh, the awareness of his presence would give us a growing confidence to, to step out and step into people's lives with invitation to talk, invitation to turn small talk into big talk, invitation to talk about the issues that they struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis. Father, we pray you'd give us opportunity, we pray you would give us wisdom, and uh, we pray you'd give us uh, an abounding love that seeks a knowledge and depth of insight, that we might uh, all know what is the best thing to do, that we might be fulfilled with the fruit of righteousness to the praise of God. We thank you, Father, for your blessings to us tonight and the way you've answered our prayers this evening and for this whole term. And we pray for those students who are preparing for the exam next week that you'd encourage their hearts as they review this material and as they get to write about it. We pray that would be a, an encouragement to them and a blessing. We ask in Christ's name. Amen.